Hi, I'm Jennifer Isabella. And I'm Keith Johnston. Your co-host for Forrester's podcast, What It Means, where we explore the latest market dynamics impacting executives and their customers. Today, we're joined by VP Research Director Mike Prue and VP Principal Analyst Julia Oss to discuss the metaverse. Welcome both. Great to be here. Thank you. So I'm excited for this conversation. Um, we're going to talk all about the metaverse because it's top of everybody's mind right now. So I guess the first thing to actually question is why is it top of mind? I mean, because, you know, the concept of virtual worlds goes all the way back to the 1968 film, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, we had the book Snow Crash in 92, which coined the phrase the metaverse. And then we've had a couple of stints at this thing. Second Life, you know, way back in 2003, we have a couple of good games in Fortnite, Roblox in 2006, which is really popular now. But now all of a sudden the entire world knows about the metaverse because one little company decided to rebrand themselves Meta last year and say that they're going to invest two, $10 billion uh, into building the metaverse. Uh, to kick it off, maybe Mike, you can just Put a frame of mind, why is the metaverse uh, so top of mind right now? And what is this thing? Well, three major things have happened. First of all, technology has evolved to the point where having metaversial experiences are much more accessible and approachable. The other big thing that's been happening, and you kind of touched upon this, is just the level of investment that companies are making into building the quote unquote metaverse. So, you know, this really started uh, about a year or two ago with companies like Epic Games, who committed to millions and millions of dollars to build out their metaverse strategy. You look at companies like Microsoft, and then, of course, the big one, Facebook, changing their parent company name to Meta Inc., was something that put it more into the pop culture and made consumers more aware of this thing called the metaverse. So there's a lot of FOMO happening because of the industry hype. We define Forrester the metaverse as the 3D experience layer of the internet. So if you think about the current web today is 2D flat pages with hyperlinks, what the metaverse will be is much more of an immersive experiences with VR spaces and augmented reality objects. And it's something that lives on top of the internet, just like the web does. So, you know, the other big debate out there, is there one metaverse or is there multiple metaverses or as I like to say, metaverse I? Uh, Forrester's point of view on that is that the metaverse is a singular phenomenon, just like the web, just like the internet, there is only one. And spoiler alert, the metaverse doesn't exist today. So, Keith, one of the things I would say, I don't actually agree with the initial premise that we all know what the metaverse is. I think there's a pocket of like influencers and people that think about Facebook a lot and people on the West Coast and people trying to sell advertising and marketers looking to do something fun and creative that know what the metaverse is. But my parents don't know what the metaverse is. My clients, you know, like digital uh, chief digital officers don't know what the metaverse is. And my 11 year old nephew doesn't know what the metaverse is. So I think we want to like temper the hype that we're creating also around everybody being so well versed in what this thing is or what it could be. But yeah, I agree with everything Mike said in terms of, you know, obviously, you know what it is and where we're headed. So what are going to be the driving forces for us to truly understand it? And as a matter of fact, let me take a step back is that I'm now thinking about, we have an entire developer community and creatives that are thinking about these new things to tap into these experiences. Mike just mentioned a bunch of companies, you know, they're going full on to it. Like, you know, what are the key drivers that are gonna make this thing real and uh, how might consumers really know what this thing is? Okay, so I think there's a few things to tear apart there. So I think one thing is like everything that Mike said is dead on. But what we've got folks doing is relabeling what they were already doing as metaverse stuff. They were already, I mean, we've been on a path with augmented reality and virtual reality and 3D online gaming for more than a decade. And those platforms have been growing, users have been growing, the developer community has been growing for more than a decade. And what we've done here over the past 12 months is simply relabel that as metaverse stuff, just like Facebook has relabeled itself. But if you go back to the question in terms of what it's going to take to get consumers interested, 
you know, the facets that we lay out in the report is this is going to start with online gamers. Um, what Mike described are metaverse-like experiences where a user can create some kind of a persona that looks like a, an avatar that they may or may not customize, and they can move around in some kind of a virtual world. A lot of it's gaming. It could be entertainment. It could be education. The second place the metaverse is going to go um, is social media, right? With Mark Zuckerberg investing $10 billion annually, that's the next place we'll see things go. So, you know, and from there, you know, we can talk about, you know, of those two categories of online gamers and those that are very deep into social media and customizing their profile, you know, where do we go next? And within those categories, there's also subgroups of those who spend a lot of money to make their experiences great, already love doing things like virtual reality um, and so forth. Julie brought up such an important point about the fact that any extended reality experience right now is being labeled or called the metaverse, and that is part of the media hype that's taking place. But the reality is that if a brand does an integration on Roblox, they're not entering the metaverse, despite what the media says. They are simply doing a branded integration on the platform Roblox, which is a standalone platform. And we call this at Forrester, we call these things metaverse precursors. We're in the era of metaverse precursors because the metaverse doesn't exist yet. And we believe that it's not going to exist until there is standard protocols for interoperability and connectivity across different immersive platforms. Is there a stepping stone between what Julie's describing today and what you're talking about, those branded experiences potentially, and the true quote unquote metaverse? There is. Uh, in, in our report, we describe the metaverse being built in three main phases. So we just described the metaverse precursor, for, precursor phase, which is what we're in right now, virtual 3D spaces and, and objects. So these are your you know, Fortnites of the world, your Robloxes, or if we want to get even more meta, you know, let's talk about Decentraland or the Sandbox. Um, the second phase, which we're calling the primordial metaverse, is really when we start to have basic linkages amongst these virtual platforms. So you can think about it akin to hyperlinks amongst uh, the web. Um, and then the eventual metaverse, where we're calling the federated metaverse, that's when you know we believe that the metaverse truly exists, where there will be governance structures and regulations and standardization, the ability to port my identity, my belongings, my presence from one platform to another. And you know, from our perspective, that is at least a decade away. So, Mike, what you're talking about, you, you're talking about these standards, which is really going to shape this thing, that whole uh, interoperability of, of these environments all working together. Um, but let's take that a step for, further. When it comes to standards and what this thing is, uh, is there going to be a standard to what it looks like, how it feels, the things I do in it, or is this really just a free-for-all? So each platform is... In, and this is what's happening today, you know, how things render on Roblox is very different to how objects render on the sandbox or Decentraland. Um, you know, we do believe that there are multiple entry points into the metaverse that it isn't, despite popular opinion and, and belief, it isn't all about having to wear VR goggles, um, that you can still experience the 3D metaverse on 2D devices. Uh, that is perfectly acceptable. And in fact, Zuckerberg announced in his last earnings call that they are exploring how to mobile enable uh, their metaver metaverse experience, which is Horizon, on your mobile device. Um, you know, technology will continue to evolve as well that will become more accessible and less intrusive. So you can think about augmented reality glasses or contact lenses. So the entry points to the metaverse will vary, and that's perfectly fine how people experience it. In terms of what it looks like and feels like, <clears throat> think about the web. You know, you go to different websites, you go to different apps. They're all different in terms of the UI and the design of it. But there are standards in terms of linkage and transfer of data and protocols, governance models, um, as well as basic rules and regulations. That's the type of standardization that we're talking about here. 
So the metaverse may be different things to different people. I'm just thinking like my eight-year-old uses Roblox and the fidelity of the games is none of his concern, um, you know, but he's just immersed. Whereas um, if we use this thing in the workplace or if a, a, an adult uses it, is it going to take sh its own shape depending on who the user is? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're looking at, Keith, is, you know, we're going to start with online gaming and we're going to start with entertainment and then we'll probably go into education because this is going to target a younger audience and then we'll go to social media. Uh, but our colleague JP Gounder also believes that the metaverse and metaverse like experiences will appear in the enterprise uh, before they even do in the home. And there's a few reasons for that. Uh, given that we've all been mostly home for the past two years, we're looking for some alternatives, some better alternatives to Zoom meetings and WebEx and Microsoft team meetings, uh, things that allow us to collaborate, allow us to engage in different ways with our colleagues, understand their emotions uh, more than we get from video. The other element of it, too, is when you think about creating a space for the ultimate immersive experience where I might have on a headset, you know, people can spend upwards of thousands of dollars to equip a room or a space to have that experience. And that's not something the average consumer can afford, but it's something that if the enterprise builds and they put that into place, lots of people can use it. And it's a, it's a higher return on that, you know, that same investment. So I, I do expect that we'll see collaboration or more serious spaces, let's say in the workplace versus those where we may play or those where we may go to school and where we may learn. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to, you know, what's going to be the driving force of this thing. Uh, make, think about like the workplace driving the metaverse, because we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about big brands going in, making their claim in the metaverse. Uh, so, you know, JP's call is a, a little bit, you know, out of left field, but the reality is no money, no metaverse. And so we're thinking that investments in the enterprise and these new experiences truly could be the anchor to push this thing forward? Well, I guess I, there, like a couple of things I want to put out there as we continue the conversation. I think the first one is, while Mike said, and I agree with, right, the metaverse is going to be possible 10 years out, it could still be like the tiniest fraction of the overall time that we spend online or on the internet, so to speak, right? There's nothing going away. Uh, the GUI interface isn't going away. Uh, conversational interfaces are only increasing in importance and certainly we'll have more immersive experiences, but there's not a point in sight where we're going to spend all or even a majority of our time in something called the metaverse. So I think that's really important to keep in mind. And then I think the second thing is, is we just really need to think about what the use cases are. You know, when consumers get online, let's say, and they want to do something, there's a good percentage of the time. I'm just like task oriented. I want to get in. I want to get something done. I want to get back out. Like, I just don't need to go shopping in the metaverse to get like toothpaste and to buy cereal. You know, I may want to go into the metaverse to shop if I want to meet one of my girlfriends who lives on the other side of the country and some, I don't know, hit new boutique just showed up, right? But, and that's when I'm in an entertainment mode, I'm engaged, I want to spend time, I want to explore, but that's not all of my time online, right? But that's where the use case is really going to have to pull this to the forefront. Technology is not going to be the limitation. Yeah, you can think about a couple of different cohorts right now that are the early metaverse adopters. So, you know, Julie already mentioned online gaming. That is the obvious on ramp to the metaverse because online gamers today, they're already immersed in 3D experiences. So the leap to go to now this interconnected metaverse is a very, very small one at best. The call that JP made, which is really interesting, is that it's enterprise use cases that's really the surprise on-ramp to the metaverse. So it's not that one is going to happen before the other, that this is all kind of happening and folding in stages in parallel, but that sort of the non-obvious cohorts, you know, more of the... Uh, the workers, people in their offices and in virtual spaces, they're going to become comfortable with metaverse-like technologies and therefore bring it back to the home in sort of a reverse co consumerization play. So I think, you know, one of the things that we're going to see with adoption of the metaverse, Keith, is there's going to be a bit of like a camel situation here with like a couple of humps, right? It's fine. And like Mike's the expert on marketing, but it's one thing 
for a marketer to go build an experience on a one-off standalone platform, just as Mike described it, like on Roblox or in Decentraland or in the Sandbox or so forth, that's one thing. But when I talk about my business and integrating with my ordering system, my payment system, my inventory, and where I'm building a business, I'm not going to build a business on a one-off platform, right? So we're not going to see that huge level of investment until we get to the point, at least 10 years out, where Mike's describing where there's this interoperability. Otherwise, as a company, there's too much risk and there's too much technical debt that I create by creating a bunch of one-off experiences on different platforms. And so that's, in my opinion, that's going to keep a lot of the investment from the BDC companies out of the metaverse until we see that interoperability that Mike described. And I think what we're talking about here are large, big investments, but that's not to say that companies aren't testing and learning even commerce experiences within the metaverse uh, and that they aren't trying to test the waters to understand what's possible. Uh, you know, it was just announced the other day that Jose Cuervo is, is building a metaverse distillery on Decentraland. And, you know, again, this is the time for brands to experiment within these metaverse precursors to just learn what is possible for those future use cases as the metaverse evolves. And I don't disagree with experimentation. I think it's a question of always like, well, what percentage of my budget is that? Because these companies have businesses to run uh, and they're struggling just to do things like mobile messaging well, to do chat well. So I think while every company can dedicate some money to experimentation, especially these big commerce companies that are targeting consumers, got to have to think very hard about running their core business and what's going to generate a return for them. So they've got to think about, well, where do immersive experiences in this eventual metaverse fit into my overall portfolio of experiences that I offer to consumers? Well, we also need them to do that, don't we? Because, I mean, the growth of the internet happened because of advertising. And, you know, if these brands don't jump in and do these experiments, take the risk of, building a little technical debt, then, you know, we can't, we can't move this thing forward fast enough, can we? All in on what you just said, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But is it like a build it and they will come moment? Because we have data on the consumer front, right? Like, right. Yeah. So here's the thing. Immersive technologies work well when consumers use them. And what we know from our Forrester moments map is we've got about 81% of consumers that are aware of what extended reality is. So that's augmented right. reality virtual, which is not the only way you can experience the metaverse. You know, it can also just be a 3D online experience on my smartphone. We've got just under 40% of consumers that use it, but we've only got 20% or that are comfortable. So if you do get that consumer that goes into a commerce experience is, oh, I do want to try it on. I do want to like see what it feels like. Absolutely. The conversion rates go up by 20, 25%. Return rates go down. The amount of browsing I do goes up by double digits. Absolutely. These technologies are effective when and if consumers use them. And that that's an, um, the biggest point of, of this whole thing is about consumers. You know, when we surveyed consumers about their attitudes on the metaverse, you know, we found about a third of consumers in the U.S. and the U.K. who are excited for the quote unquote metaverse. Um, less than that, think that it's going to be good for society. So we're talking about an uphill battle of changing consumer perceptions. The other aspect, Keith, to the advertiser comment is when we surveyed uh, B2C marketing executives within the U.S., 76% of them said that they are or planning to invest some of their marketing budget in metaverse-related activities this year. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why so many of these metaverse precursor platforms are just inundated with brands trying to uh, do activations on them. But just 14% of U.S. adults and 12% of U.K. adults feel that brands should build more branded experiences. So what that tells us is that it is critical that as brands are activating within these metaverse precursors, they're creating some type of value exchange that is really compelling for the consumer so that it's not simply a one and done throwaway investment. That 76% is a really big number. So we're not talking, would you recommend every brand to try something in the metaverse or is it just some companies? It depends on 
your goals as a business, your marketing strategy, most importantly, what you're trying to do with your consumers to engage with them, um, the mistake that many brands make, and it's not just with the metaverse, but it's with you know lots of different types of digital activations and experiences, uh, is being myopic and simply saying, we need to be there because it's cool and we're feeling the sense of FOMO and everyone else is doing it. So strategy and planning is critical for any branded metaverse plans within marketing. So Keith, let me tell you a different side of the story that I hear from the, the folks that are responsible on the, the commerce side of the business that are running these B2C businesses. When we survey those executives, we've got less than 5% executives that we survey that are either building some kind of an AR or a VR experience today. So it's, it's less than 5%. And in the interviews that I've done, this is anecdotal, it's not statistically significant like the survey that Mike has, but in about the 15 executives that I've interviewed around the importance of the metaverse to their business and how much of a priority it is and how much awareness or interest there is in their organization, of the 15, I've had to explain to at least half of them what the metaverse is, how much of a priority the metaverse is from their business goes some, on a scale of one to 10, goes from negative five to about two. And then how much interest there is, you know, goes somewhere from about one to four. And you might sometimes get a higher number if that company has an innovation team and is looking further into the future. So not disagreeing with anything about what marketers are doing or what they should be doing. I think this is still a place where companies or brands are experimenting and it's not where they're placing bets on what their core business should be doing to drive commerce or to drive loyalty with their customers yet. Which fascinates me, Julie, because, you know, even just today, AdAge did at least three stories about the metaverse. AdWeek, pick up any industry trade and it is just fraught with the term metaverse. You can't get away from it at this point. So it fascinates me that, uh, you know, that particular cohort of, uh, of, of our client base, uh, it doesn't necessarily know, know what it is. That's that's fascinating because on one hand, if we move uh, too fast, I think some would fear that we might get it wrong. Um, we haven't even talked about the idea that, you know, just like there's a dark side to the internet, is there a dark side to this metaverse? Uh, is there some, you know, is there some risk with privacy, mental health? I mean, could we move too fast with this thing? There is. So, you know, one of the things that Martha Bennett addressed in our report is uh, just basic decorum and rules for, for governance and, and regulations. There have already been some incidences that, uh, that Meta Horizon have had to, to deal with from um, people's avatars getting too close in proximity and effectively harassing other avatars. And so they've enabled proximity settings that you can control on how close other avatars get to you. That's something that's perfect for me that has issues with personal space, um, but it speaks to the fact that there are things that are happening that are nefarious, not only in these metaverse precursors, which also existed years ago in the likes of Second Life and other virtual worlds. Um, but there's also scandals and scams that are happening with NFTs. See, that's fascinating to me because I would think that if we're going to create a whole new world, that we would at least learn from what's going on in the real world and not make the same mistakes in the metaverse. You mean <laughs> copy what we're doing in social media and port it over to the metaverse? Exactly. I mean, that's probably yeah. part of the reason why consumers are skeptical right now, right? I would assume those associations are very real. They are, Jen. And um, that is one of the fears uh, of what Facebook is doing with the metaverse because of the baggage that they have had. And, you know, when we surveyed consumers and we showed them a list of quote unquote, metaverse companies or metaverse platforms, we ask them to what degree do they associate each with the metaverse? No surprise that meta, 
which you know we qualified as formerly Facebook Inc. Meta was the one that was chosen the most in terms of the association. But when we asked another question on um, to what degree is Meta the leader in the metaverse, it was a much smaller percentage of people. Um, and so there is this belief uh, in some cases that, um, or I should say fear that Meta uh, will you know, cause and create additional issues akin to what has happened within their past in social media around privacy. So you know, that is the weird irony, Keith, that, that you brought up. The promise of the metaverse and, and why there was so much excitement and vision around it is that it was going to be this, you know, truly decentralized entity and sort of this utopian world and, you know, everything is great. And, and that is, you know, akin to the promise of quote unquote web three. Um, but reality doesn't necessarily match promise and, and we've got a ways to go. And so, you know, the, the, the line out there is that as the metaverse is becoming developed, can we, as an industry, ensure privacy by design? Can we ensure, you know, the, the type of uh, ethical behavior that um, we can engender through, again, standards, regulations, protocols, and just the overall user experience? Hey, Keith, can I go back to one of the things you said about, um, like, talking about people never getting off their sofas again and never leaving the house? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... One of the things that we know about mobile, right, is, you know, people spend like 85% of their time in just five apps. And it's not that different uh, with online, right? So kids are going to do online gaming. They're going to do YouTube. Uh, folks that are older like us might be doing social media and other things. But when we talk about these metaverse-like experiences, right, and we talk about them being in entertainment and gaming, when we think about what they're substituting for, right, it will be in meeting, it will be in gaming, it will be concerts, it will be online education. So I see the metaverse as an evolution of those experiences. But on the flip side, when we look at the percentage of consumers that download a dedicated shopping app or spend time in a dedicated, let's say, shopping app for clothing or shoes or otherwise, the numbers are very low and the amount of time is very low. So I think, you know, one of the things that these commerce players are going to have to consider is if consumers aren't going to spend a lot of time there, is that the right place to put my investment? Or is it a better thing for me to do to market on the existing platforms and borrow those moments where customers already are versus trying to build my own moments in this metaverse? Because it's going to be very hard to attract consumers into those spaces, just like it's hard to get them to download apps and spend that time online as well today. And it's important to point out that the vision of the metaverse is not simply consumers going into it. It's also about the metaverse coming to them. So we talk about it as a bi-directional type of thing where uh, virtual objects will become present in the physical world. Uh, through holographic projections and the like. So, you know, when we talk to companies like Neantic, you know, they talk about, and they've been very public about this as enabling the physical metaverse because their whole thing, of course, is augmented reality. So it's augmenting the physical reality that we're in. So I think it's a really important point, Mike, right? Because one of the things, the biggest unknowns here is what is the market for virtual goods beyond a handful of speculators that dominate that market today and beyond a very small number of online gamers or those that are very you know, dedicated to customizing their profile on social media, just how big is that market and how much money will consumers spend on virtual goods? Yeah, and, and, and we don't know yet, right? But what we do know is that it will become a bigger market if and as virtual spaces and environments and presence and identity most important becomes more important to society. So the more value that society places on your digital identity, the more value things like personalizing your avatar, buying artwork for your virtual home space becomes more important and more of a necessity for everyday people. Yeah, and, and you're bringing two things together. Is that I like the word value, the more value that the metaverse can bring. And Julie was talking about the higher level of utility to more 
you know, the more adoption there will be. Great conversation. I feel like we're going to be talking a lot more about this as it evolves because, you know, clearly we need to be tracking consumer sentiment on this, the technical capabilities, but all the other ingredients seem to be there to, you know, to, you know, experiment with this world. We have uh, lots of capital that is all in on this. Uh, there's certainly brands that have interests. So it seems to me that there's definitely the, you know, the tech leaders out there and the brands that are probably going to bring the ex experimentation of this uh, party is what's going to start to drive this in the near term. So uh, Mike, if you can just, you know, talk to CMOs out there, you talk about the, the precursors, what advice do you have for those C CMOs to, to, you know, experiment with this right now in some meaningful way? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the advice that we're giving to CMOs now, which is innovate consumer usages, but keep investments modest right now. You know, understand your consumer base, think about the type of value that you could provide to them, even through experimentation within these metaverse precursor platforms, and look to conceive those future opportunities as the metaverse actualizes. So testing and learning becomes critical. We don't suggest that CMOs simply ignore what's going on, but embrace the changes that are happening, embrace the evolution of extended reality, um, but don't go all in yet. And Julie, for the, you know, all the technologists out there, uh, particularly CIOs and CTOs that, uh, maybe bringing uh, JP's call to life, which is bringing the metaverse to the workplace um, or other, like what's your advice for those tech leaders out there that, you know, should probably get their arms around this, this thing one way or another right now before it actually is a thing. So my advice to tech leaders would be first, you know, no FOMO, no fear of missing out here, right? The important thing today is still to stay the course you know, focus on your digital experiences portfolio and make smart decisions. But as a chief technology officer, someone in the tech space, it also has to look forward. I'm thinking about, not to oversimplify, but there's the front end part of this experience and then there's the back end. And the front end experience or the experience layer on top doesn't tend to be as expensive and the lead times are relatively low to create and turn these experiences on. What's really hard to do is the stuff that's below the glass or it's the engine that powers my experiences. So my identity, my customer profiles, the intelligence engines, the analytics, the data that I have. And so as a technology leader, I have to think about what has a long lead time and where can I catch up later if I need to? And so that I don't get caught needing to turn something on and I've got three to five years ahead of me before I can do that. Fantastic advice. I appreciate it. Like I said, I think we're going to be talking about this thing for a long time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Julie. Thanks for having us. Hey, thanks. It's been a lot of fun. To discover more about brands in the metaverse, join Mike, Julie, and other Forrester analysts at CX North America on June 7th through the 9th. Meet us in person in Nashville or join us virtually. Register now at 4.com slash CX-NA-2022. That's F-O-R-R dot com slash CX-NA-2022. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, and share. Thanks for listening.